Amelia's PCB layouts represent the finest of old world craftsmanship. Each individual trace is meticulously hand routed by skilled artisans with hours of painstaking labor going into each masterful connection from one lovingly placed pin to another. Uh, no. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, and that meticulous hand routing, uh, that's totally not happening. As proud as I am of my crazy board routing skills, the size and complexity of today's designs requires more than mad skills. And when complex standards like DDR are involved, it gets even tougher. My guest today is Hemet Shah of Cadence Design Systems, and we're going to talk about the latest in PCB routing technology that blends your skills and expertise with intelligent automation for a best-of-both-worlds layout solution. Also, before we get started, remember to click the links below the player. There you can download a free white paper entitled Auto Interactive Delay Tuning. You can also watch another archived webinar about this topic. Welcome, Hemet. Thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to be here. So, for a lot of us doing board design, when we're dealing particularly with standards like DDR, we run into a lot of challenges with signal integrity and timing closure. And that is a lot about routing. So let's talk about routing technology a little bit and what the options are. Great question, Amelia. What you have is several options to tackle your routing challenge. Okay. Traditionally, the industry depended on automatic routing technologies. Mm -hmm. And then all PCB design tools give you interactive editing capabilities. Yeah. And typically, most users have these two as options. Okay. Recently, Cadence has introduced some new technologies that is a combination of the two, mm. using the power of automatic router and the intuition or the intelligence of the PCB designer to guide it. Okay. And we call this technology auto-interactive technologies. Okay, so I'm really intrigued about this auto-interactive business because it seems like it has the best of both worlds. So given these options, what sort of approach do you take? So Amelia, the good thing is besides being the best of the both worlds is that you as a designer can deploy the auto-interactive technologies without changing your methodologies. Great, okay. It allows you to apply it to the routing portion, it allows you to apply it to the planning portion, and uh -huh. it allows you to apply it during the optimization or tuning phases to meet your timing. Great, this kind of looks like what I already do. Correct, it does. However, a lot of times what you do is a lot of manual work during this methodology. This is where the auto part of it can help you get out of having to do it manually. Gotcha. You as a PCB designer, define the strategies, the sequence of steps to take, which signals to route. The auto part of it goes ahead and finishes the work for you where you ask it to. Fantastic. Okay, so I've entered my address in the GPS, but uh, Hemet, where do we go from here? <laughs> That's a great question. That, so let's, let's peel the onion on the routing part of it. Yeah. So you planned your routes, your next step is to get them connected. One of the first things you have to do to get them connected is to get your routes out of a dense BGA. Mm. This is becoming more of a problem for most people because the BGAs with increasing number of pin counts and shrinking pin pitch is becoming more of a challenge on a daily basis. Mm. So let me step back and say, let's put aside for the fact, how do you get out of a BGA? We'll right. touch upon that a little later. What people tend to do is get out of the BGA from one end, then route from that BGA to the other BGA. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the other BGA, you find out that you've got a lot of crossings. Right. And you have two choices now. You get to that point and look at the crossings and say, can I resolve these crossings for this group of nets I'm trying to route or this interface or a byte plane that I brought to the BGA? Or do I go back and undo some of the work and unravel the crossings? Right. So typically what a lot of people tend to do is to try to resolve the crossings in one of the two ends. Okay. And then at some point in time, they get stuck and they have two choices. One is to back out or add vias to get the connection into the other BGA or connector. Right. Now we all know, you know, 
dealing with DDR2s, DDR3s, that you want to keep all of these signals, at least on a byte plane basis, on a same layer. Right. Right? So VIAs is a no-no. Yeah. So it often means that if you're dealing with DDR3, DDR4s in future, mm -hmm. you have to back out your routes and sort of iterate the process. You go back and forth, back right. and forth. This is where the auto-interactive technologies, let me show you first example of what it can do for you. Great. So instead of unraveling one end and routing the trunk, if you will, yeah. going from BGA to the other end, mm -hmm. and then dealing with crossovers, we have a tool that allows you to plan the crossovers from both ends simultaneously, allows you to view them together, allows you to plan the crossovers, and migrate the crossovers from one end to the other end. Ah, okay. So it gives you the visual feedback, it shows you the crossovers more succinctly than tools out there, mm -hmm. and allows you to pick and choose which crossovers need to happen on which end of the bundle, if you will, one end going to one BGA, the other end to the other BGA. So right. the feedback process and the automation that allows you to swap the crossovers is where this technology helps you. Great, okay. So look at this example, for instance. In the previous example, the designer had broken out from the BGA on the left, mm -hmm. routed the trunk, and went to the other end. Yeah. In this example, what we're showing is leave the middle portion as is, and then analyze your crossovers, what's left over. You click on a set of crossovers, and you can look at what it means to migrate that crossover to the other end. Right, okay. So now you've got a visual clue that auto part of it is doing the work for you. Mm -hmm. And you can visually see if transferring the crossover from one end to the other end is solvable by you. And you as a designer can make the determination much better and faster than any automatic tool can. Right, yeah. So this is where you sort of apply the power of the auto mm -hmm. in smaller sizes and smaller steps where you think it will help you do what you want to accomplish. That makes so sense. So you are the driver apply your intelligence or apply your intuition and let the engine do the work that you want it to do. Gotcha, okay. So I'm beginning to see how this auto interactive stuff can really help us as designers. The computer can do all the mundane work while we do all the fun stuff, right Emmett? That's right. You focus on the strategy mm -hmm. and let the tool do its work. And the other thing that we provide in this case is instead of looking at the both ends in one screen, we provide the ability to split the screen so that you can zoom in to both ends simultaneously and in a split screen mode sort of look at where the crossings are and how you want to migrate back and forth. I have this problem all the time. If I zoom out to see everything, I lose all the details. That's right. So this split view allows you to focus on the detail on both ends of it without worrying about the trunk in the middle. Right. The piece that you can, once resolve the crossings, you can get through. Nice. So this basically reduces the routing steps and improves your efficiency and let the computer do the mundane works, if you will. Okay, so I'm starting to understand this auto-interactive stuff. Do you have any more fun tricks that we can do with this? Sure do. So remember we talked about getting out of a BGA is a challenge. Right. Typically, the number of pins on a BGA is increasing, mm -hmm. and the pin pitch is going down. Yeah. It just means that it's harder to get out of it. Right. Sometimes you can go down to smaller trace widths, and you can have one between or two between and three between, whatever, whatever your geometries allow. But even with all of that, getting out of a BGA is still a challenge. So one of the things that we introduced recently is what we call scribble a path. Oh, you know, okay. Basically, you as a designer scribble a path you want a particular connection to take through the BGA pin field. Okay. And the computer will go in and put the path itself. Nice. All right. So it's just one click, pick the starting point, uh -huh. and just move your cursor through the pin field slide you would want the route to go, and the computer will go put in if there's room and if without any DRC errors. Yeah. So it goes ahead and puts that. Fantastic. That's cool. Let me show you more examples of where it helps. Please. So in this particular example, the scribbling is on the bottom leftmost pin all the way to upper rightmost pin. Yeah. And you can see the highlight path. We sort of highlighted it so that you can see the path. It doesn't have to be with clicks around that. Mm -hmm. And what the computer did, not only it put in the path according to your preferences of 45 degrees and so on, but it also had to move some of the other existing traces out of the way so you are DRC compliant. Right. 
So it'll do it without introducing any DRC errors. So this is the push and shove that it's doing or chamfering more on some of these traces that are out there. Right, move aside, I'm coming through. That's right. <laughs> Here's another example where this technology really takes away the mundane work for you. In this particular example, the only way you could get that trace through the pins was through an off-angle route. Right. The space is so tight that the actual angle has to be accurate. Yeah. The example on the bottom is showing you that the clearance is even tighter and you had to really have a jog with a non-orthogonal trace, uh -huh. off-angle trace, if you will, yeah. to get it through correctly. To do this manually will take a lot of effort for you. Yeah. Lots of clicks, make sure you did the right distance and, and get it right. So right. this with the scribble, what you get is you scribble a path, given the rules, was there, the route engine will go ahead and figure out the path for you. And so I can see really how this is not just a productivity tool, but also can help with my routes that are really hard to draw, right? Right, right, exactly. Saves you a lot of time, a lot of headache, and right. a lot of stress. So now that I got my routes connected, uh, we haven't talked about the timing closure part yet. That's right. That's the next step. So we talked about your existing methodology of plan your route, connect the points to ends of it, do the routing point yep. to point. And we showed you how you can apply this auto-interactive technology to the routing portion of it. Let's talk about what you can do with this auto-interactive technology for optimizing your signals to meet timing. Fantastic. Yeah. There are two types of optimization most people do. You do it every day when yeah. you deal with DDRs. Uh, DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, is you first do phase tuning on your differential pairs, mm -hmm. and then you do delay tuning. Right. This is the methodology you follow, I'm sure. Yeah. So let's talk about that first with what we call is the timing closure environment. Now, typically, your system gives you interactive edge editing capabilities. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's system does that. That is uh, something that everybody uses. And then there's different ways the system that you use provides you feedback. Right. In our case, we provide the feedback two ways. One is through heads-up display. So as you are tuning your signal interactively, adding length or add connect, mm -hmm. there's a heads-up display that gives you feedback on critical constraints on that net. Yeah. And that's good because it's on the canvas. The second way we provide feedback is through constraint manager. Okay. Constraint manager houses all the constraints on all your nets. And as you are routing those and optimizing those nets, as you meet those timing constraints, Constraint Manager marks that as green. If you are not meeting constraints, it'll mark it as red. Okay. So okay. it's a great display. It's a good thing. The challenge that you face is when you're dealing with advanced interfaces like DDR2, DDR3, where the timing margin is getting tighter and tighter, Yeah. you have to match your clocks with the signals in the byte lanes, you have to match the clocks with the strobes, and, right, and yeah. then you have to match some of these signals from byte lane one to byte lane two to three mm -hmm. and four. So all of that information becomes really hard to present in a spreadsheet-like format like a constraint manager does. Yeah. It's all there, but it's not easily something you can look and decide what you have to do to fix the problem. Right, yeah. So all of the data is there. A lot of the computation is done for you. Mm -hmm. but it's kind of hard for you to develop your strategies staring at numbers. Right, yeah. So what we have come up with and introduced recently is what we call the timing vision. It is the next level of feedback and information provided to you. Mm -hmm. And also in the timing vision, we added the auto part of it, and I'll talk about it a little later. And then the second thing we have is auto-interactive utilities to help you do phase tuning on your differential pairs, and delay tuning on byte lanes and the interfaces. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about timing vision. So this is the current interactive edge editing environment for most PCB designers, right? Okay. There's the PCB design canvas. Maybe you have a system that has heads up display and maybe you don't, but yeah. you have the PCB canvas. And then because the constraints have grown, you want to have a separate window for constraint manager. So you have two screens, one for the canvas and one for the constraint manager. Right. I have colleagues who have those two screens plus one more for the schematic. Right? That's right. There are some people who are lucky enough to get the third screen from their <laughs> management, and, and, right. and they get three of them, and, and they go out and tell the rest of the world, I've got three. <laughs> <laughs> now, the challenge with this setup is that as you are tuning your signals, you are constantly, as a designer, going back and forth between the design canvas and the constraint manager. Right. And the current setup is in an iterative process where you tune certain signals, go back to constraint manager, check it, 
Constraint managers, in our case, provides real-time feedback, so you don't have to do anything, but you're constantly changing your focus right. from one screen to the other screen. Now, the other thing that you don't get is you don't get the feedback on a match group level. Hmm. Until all signals meet timing in a group, that entire set of signals don't go green. Ah. So now as you're working through it and you fix a few of the signals in your match group, mm -hmm. constraint manager is not showing it as green because it doesn't meet the constraint as you've defined it. Right. So you have no way of knowing how much closer you've gotten to your goal right. of okay. tuning yeah. all of these signals. So yeah. let's say you're working at a bike lane at a time and you, you fix three of the signals, you just don't know that three of them are fixed. There's no feedback mechanism. Right. The other thing is that when you're focusing on a bike lane at a time, you have to also match some of these signals between byte lanes. Mm -hmm. And there's just no way to compute or develop a strategy of what to do to byte lane one so that it continues to help you with byte lane two, three, and four also because there's cross dependencies of these signals. Yeah. So that's something that a lot of PCB designers tend to do some sort of calculations based on where they are, based on how they've routed the signals, trying to figure out how to get from there to time enclosure some set of manual calculations, some use spreadsheet, mm -hmm. and so on. I'm sure you use spreadsheets as well. Yeah. These are some of the high-level challenges that most PCB designers face. But Constraint Manager kind of gives me that, right? It, it does, but what it doesn't give you is the ability to see the progress as you're getting some of these signals in the target range. Ah, I see. Okay. Let me show you a few examples on how this new timing vision environment will help you with that. Great, okay. So here's an example of your point-to-point -point connections. You're done, you're looking at it, and to know where you stand in terms of meeting your timing constraints, you have to go to Constraint Manager. Yeah. With this new timing vision capability that we have introduced, you get to see a picture like this, where we color code the signals to show you which signals are good, mm -hmm. which signals are too short, okay. and which signals are too long. In this particular example, yellow is long, uh -huh. and you need to shorten it. Red is short, you need to elongate it. Mm -hmm. And the green ones are meeting timing. So this is a visual feedback that you get, and there's more this, this capability does. Yeah, so this is good. It seems like color coding traces, but Hemet, show me the money here. <laughs> right, right, I, I knew you would ask that. <laughs> so this system will give you more than just color coding. So color coding takes away you having to go back and forth. Yeah. It also tells you which signals you should touch, which signals you should leave alone. Yeah. It also goes ahead and does the calculations we talked about earlier. What you need to do to get these signals into compliance oh, with your okay. timing constraints. So it does the calculations for you. It helps you develop a strategy on which signals you should fix first or which signals you should leave alone. Okay. So this does more than just color coding. Color coding is good because yeah. you don't have to go back and forth between Design Canvas and Constraint Manager. Yeah. It provides you with additional smart targets. So let me give you an example. Typically, if you as a user, as a designer, choose a target, typically it's the clock net or the strobes signals mm -hmm. because that's what the signal integrity guy told you you <laughs> got a match to. Right. When you route these signals point to point, when you want to get into timing compliance, you may want to look at a different net to match your lens to. Mm, okay. For example, if you have a long net here and you cannot shorten that signal at all, then you want all other signals to match to that long net. Right, okay, yeah. So now you need to take your target net, which could be a clock or a strobe or something else the SI guy told you to, you have to elongate that. Yeah. And elongating the target is one of the things you end up doing by that smart data feedback. Ah, okay. okay. All of this is something you manually figure out, visually figure out, looking at the constraint manager. Mm -hmm. With this system, smart vision or, or timing vision in the smart mode gives you that intelligence that you need to go get all your signals in compliance of timing constraints. Okay, great. Let me show you a few examples. Please do. So there are two modes in timing vision. One is the DRC mode. Mm -hmm. This is what you are most familiar with. Yeah. You've got the constraint manager giving you feedback. You run DRC before you sign off and say, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So this is what our DRC system does. And this is sort of like the sign-off system, right? Yeah. If the DRC system says all of the rules are met, then you're good to go. Yeah. What we've introduced in addition to that is a smart timing mode. So smart data that I told you that our timing vision provides, it finds you a critical net or a virtual target 
mm. that you must route to given the current set of routes you've done. Ah, Based okay. on the point-to-point -point topology you've done, now you're trying to tune it. Now with the new virtual target and new goals set by the smart mode, mm -hmm. if you meet those new goals to this virtual target, then all of your signals will be in compliance. Ah, all right, okay. Let me give you some more visual examples. Yes, please. So here's an example of where you have this bike lane here. The red signal is the one that you're trying to match to, or if it's too short, you gotta match, but the others are too long as well. Yeah. As you're meeting timing, generally, in the previous example we talked about, if you have a long signal, you're gonna try to match to that because yeah. you can't get shorten it. So in this particular case, the bottom signal is the longest one, and everybody's trying to match to that. Yeah. You notice I've got three signals that I've got tuning done to match it, but the system still says it's too long because the target is the red one. Right. Relatively speaking, it's too short, but everything else cannot match up to that because it's too short. Right. In this particular case, in the DRC mode, it shows you no progress, even though three signals have been tuned. Mm. In the smart mode, the virtual target is highlighted yeah. in this pattern, so you know that's the signal. The first thing you know is that if that's my critical signal, I don't want to add any more length to it. So you want to make sure you don't push and shove, accidentally increase its length. Right, yeah. So that's the first thing you notice. In this particular example we looked at before, the three signals that I've tuned are turned green. That means they are meeting the timing compared to this critical new virtual target that the system has provided to you. Gotcha. So you see the progress as you go. Right. The other beauty of this is you can do this tuning in any order that you wish. Hmm. It is not order dependent. Nice. With the DRC system, there's a particular order you must follow, sequence of steps you must follow. Right. To get to the sign off stage. Yeah. Whereas in this particular case, once I'm in timing mode, timing vision mode, and in the smart DRC mode particularly, I don't have to follow a particular order. Nice. So I see that this is much more than a pretty picture. It shows my progression and also tells me what I should do, right? Correct. Okay, what about differential pairs? Because we aren't just trying to match lengths, right? That's true. We have to match phase for differential pairs. Yeah. In many of these advanced high-speed standards, you have lots of differential pairs that have tight phase requirements. And you have phase requirements for both static phase requirements and dynamic phase requirements. Right. So here's an example of what you would see in the timing vision with the DRC phase mode. It shows you the differential pair and shows the entire net not meeting the plus and minus 10 mil static phase rule. Okay. Now, what that doesn't tell you is what to do or where to fix this. Right. Right. So you, on your own, have to figure it out and fix this. Yeah. In the smart phase mode, what it shows you is that you can leave the differential pair on the right side alone because it meets the requirements, mm -hmm. and then you can go fix it on the left side. Oh, okay. So now it's fine-tuned it or zoomed you into an area that you should fix. Keep in mind, it also changed the plus or minus goal for you. Here's the example of where it recomputes the min-max based on what's routed. Right. There's a min-max rule for the entire net before it's routed. That's in Constraint Manager. Mm -hmm. Here, it computed it based on the differential pair on the right, which it says leave it alone. Yeah. But you lost six mils out of it on the right side. But if you fix it within four mils on the left side, Overall, you'll be within plus or minus 10 mils. You're fine. Cool. Okay. So, Hemet, there are some intelligence beside color coding going on here, right? How does that work? Yeah, let me show you how the smart mode actually works. Yes, please. In a conceptual way. So, here's an example where the target net is 500 mils long. Okay. Signal A is 600 mils long, and the longest one is 700 mils long. Right. Okay. Now, if you were to strictly look at the target net, try to match all of these signals, mm -hmm. you would have to shorten signal A and the longest one by 200 mils. Right. And sometimes it's not possible to take one or the other and shorten it. Right. What the smart mode will do is recompute a virtual target, ah. give you a net or a virtual target number uh -huh. to match to. And this is where the new min-max rules come for you. So for this longest signal now, it would be within plus or minus 20 mils, so it doesn't have any tolerance to move if it is within 20 mils. Yeah. Whereas the other signal A and other signals that may be part of this byte lane have to be elongated to match the virtual target. Ah, right. Okay. So this is where the smart mode gives you a virtual target, new min-max rules to bring all these signals into compliance. Okay. So, Hemet, why wouldn't I use smart data all the time? 
It's a great question because you're used to using the DRC system. And I said earlier that you need the DRC system to sign off. It's a right. great question. Let me show you a graphic of what we recommend based on this is that earlier you're in the design cycle, you want to use the smart data. Okay. Because you got your signals routed, you want to get them all into tuning. Right. But the, as you get closer to finishing your set of signals interface or design, mm -hmm. you want to use the DRC mode to see if you're in compliance for all of the constraints that you need to be. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay, Hemet, recap the timing vision part of this for me. I think I need a little refresher. Sure. We have a lot of technology, so I can understand. It does a lot of things in multiple areas. Yeah. So one of the biggest thing it does is gives you the feedback on the canvas. Ah. But like we talked about before, it's not just coloring the traces alone. Right. There's some smart data calculations that go on. There's feedback. There's calculation of the new virtual target and what new min-max goals are. Yeah. So all of that under the hood is the auto part of it. And the interactive part is what you end up doing with the data that's presented to you on the screen. Right. Basically, it allows you to address your timing requirements quickly and efficiently. Mm -hmm. Shortens your time to get your routes done. Yeah. And, of course, helps you not bang your head against the wall. That's Everyone loves that. <laughs> All right, Hammett, this is cool, but I am still manually tuning here. If the system has so much intelligence, couldn't the system do this for me? Great, great question. That's a great question. So we've talked about the timing vision. This is the feedback. So remember I said that we introduced two new things. Yeah. One is the timing vision. We talked about that. Uh -huh. And the second one is helping you do the tuning of your signals. Right. And there are two types of tuning we talked about. The phase tuning for differential pairs mm -hmm. and delay tuning for all of the signals. So the phase tuning, phase, here's an example of a differential pair that's out of phase in the Timing vision shows you one is too long and one is too short. Yeah. We have a utility that's called auto-interactive phase tuning. What you do is just select the differential pair and say, tune it for me. Huh, okay. And the system automatically goes in. In this particular example, you can see that it changed the pad entry for one of the traces. Yeah. It added bumps into the other to meet time phase goals. Nice, okay. So that's one example. The second example on tuning is technology we call auto-interactive delay tuning. It works much like I talked about with the face tuning, mm -hmm. in that you as a PCB designer pick the byte lane you want to tune. Yeah. And which byte lane you want to tune first. Sure. And this is something that you are good with looking at the screen. Mm -hmm. You can figure out which one will cause problems if you do it in a different order. Mm -hmm. So you choose the byte lane that makes most sense to tune first, like you would do it manually. Right. And let the system then go tune it based on the constraints that are in the system. Ah, okay. So in this particular example, you can see there are four byte lanes there, uh -huh. and in this particular example, the designer chose one byte lane at a time, probably from the bottom of that byte lanes going up to the right. Yeah, so we're one cooking. Byte lane at a, <laughs> one byte lane at a time. And yeah. it goes and does it according to DRC rules, Yeah, and there are several other controls that you can set in controlling this. And we see that PCB designers can save 50% or more of their time tuning these kind of signals. Wow. Okay. 50% or more. But Hemet, that's impressive. Do you have customers that are actually seeing that number? Or is that just a marketing number? Not come no, on. <laughs> this is proven by customer feedback. Here's one example where a customer took two different types of boards uh -huh. through this. It's an actual design where it would have taken 15 hours to do it manually. It took them five hours to do it with auto-interactive delay tune and phase tuning. Wow. All right. And that's a 67% reduction in the other case, the tablet PC case, is a 68% reduction. So very impressive. Yeah. More than 50% is what we anticipated based on some of the typical cases we see. But it's a function of how dense your board is, how right. much room you have, and how many signals you have on the board. Yeah. All right, Hammond. Is that just one customer or is this applicable to everybody or is it just one company you're talking about? No, there are lots of customers that have found the benefits. We introduced this technology back in 2012. Okay. And we ask the customers to give us feedback on this technology. And we got feedback from companies that are doing developing cloud computing solutions. We've got feedback from companies that are developing reference boards for processes for networking industries. We nice. got feedback from a service bureau, Freedom CAD. Nice. And you can see that Freedom CAD was able to do this three to four times faster than they would normally do it. Wow. Which is 75% or more production yeah. in their design cycle time. Fantastic. Okay, Hemet, let's circle back and recap the main points because I think I need more coffee after this business. <laughs> 
Well, in fact, you can do a lot of this and really take a nice break. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've talked about is that you as a designer have the option to choose a wide spectrum of technologies to apply to your routing challenges. Great. So you can go from automatic routing to interactive routing to auto-interactive. Yeah. You as a designer choose where you want to apply that. That's nice. The new auto-interactive routing technologies that we talked about, breakout technology was the first one we talked about. It accelerates time to break out and connect interfaces. We talked mm -hmm. about being able to get out of the BGAs using Scribble. Yeah. Less clicks. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you are able to get more accurate routes in between pins when you have to do off angle or very small segments right. when the space is very tight. Yeah. And then last but not the least, innovative new technologies we introduced with timing vision, the smart mode within timing vision, and the auto interactive phase and delay tuning. Yeah. You can reduce the time to route those signals to get them into compliance by up to 70%. Nice. That's fantastic. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Hemet. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. It's a pleasure talking to you, Amelia. That click here to watch button below your player. There you can check out a video entitled Auto Interactive Delay Tuning. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the on demand section of eejournal.com.